Right, well, hello and welcome to another episode, finally. We've been, been a bit of a delay because we had a bit of a plan and it fell apart, but welcome to another episode of Autofocus. And this week, we're going to have a little look at jigs. Um, we use jigs for alignment of chassis and vari various tasks that require precise alignment for most of our vehicle builds. Uh, and I thought, uh, as we touched on stripping the car down, cleaning up, and we'd done a little bit on welding, I thought now is probably a good time to talk about jigs. A lot, this isn't something that a lot of people are going to be dealing with at home, but it's also something that I, in my experience, a lot of people don't really know. There's a bit of a mystique about putting a car on a jig, um, and, and not so many people know what that involves. So I thought we'd just talk a little bit about what that involves and why we do it. So when we're doing some alignment critical operations on a car body shell or a chassis, or we're building a chassis from scratch, it's very important to keep all the datum, all the important uh, position critical parts of that car located accurately. Particularly, obviously, if we're building a chassis from scratch, then you, des you might do a design which involves the suspension pickups being in certain positions. And if, if you're just working in free space, it's very hard to ensure that those suspension pickups end up in the positions you wanted them to be in. So having some sort of framework to build those on is quite important. Now, what you can do um, is build a specific frame to locate all those parts rel rel relative to a level flat floor each time you need to do the job. However, that becomes quite time inefficient and very, very expensive. So an alternative way of doing it is to have a slightly more generic frame to work from that you can then tailor the the, the, more, the extremities of to hold what you're trying to locate in position uh, and that's what a jig then gives you uh, we there are a number of different types of jig we use the select jig bench which is here in front of me at the moment I'm going to go into more detail in a minute that's a type of jig it's a frame machine as we as select refer to it and that's probably a good way of describing it it's basically some large rails that don't bend or move uh, that you can then bolt things onto. We'll come into more detail in a minute. That's one type. Uh, another type, which is also the same as that, would be a car aligner type jig. They're slightly different in the way they work, but basically they're a big frame that things bolt onto to locate parts of the car. There are other types of jig which are more common in crash repair, which have kind of overtaken this type in a crash repair environment. Uh, which are the, the generic sort of pull type jigs, where there's a small uh, frame that goes up underneath the car bolts onto usually the sills or a couple of or probably four key locations and then enables you to pull crashed parts of the car to shape and then a laser based measuring system would be typical on mon modern um, systems where you use a laser to check the alignment of all the parts of the car and then you just pull it until they're in alignment measured with the laser that's another type not so useful for what we do here the frame type machine is more useful when you're trying to build a chassis from scratch or when you're trying to hold a given body shell in alignment while you do some radical work to it. And that is, that's what's about to be going on here. We'll elaborate on that slightly more in a moment. So, coming back to the select type jig bench, which is the type of bench that we use, you can see one in front of us. We have two more over there. The basic mode of operation of these uh, jigs is that you have the basic chassis, which is the red bit here, which is, two, which is two beams welded together, all quite substantially held together. Onto that, you bolt these beam sections, which we have a number of on top. These bolt onto that frame in a number of locations. Now, what we have, what Select provide is a manual of a variety of places that all the parts, all their sub subsequent parts can bolt onto that frame. And we'll do a little close up of that. This is the frame drawing for this particular BMW, which uh, this BMW E30, which is going to be fitted to this jig. What that enables is but from a generic bench and some generic beams and then these generic tower units which then bolt to the beams and then some parts, some specific parts that go into the top of those towers, it enables you to fit any car to the same machine with the minimum of unique parts. So as an example, this little top section of this tower here will be unique to a certain application. This one's not particularly technical, but that would be a unique part. But then these are all a generic type of tower 
and types. They're all standard items from Select. They come in different heights. But you can, you know, there are, that's an MZ80 tower. It's 80 millimeters tall. Um, this one, I can't actually remember how tall this one is. An, uh, an M, uh, it's 260, an MZ260, that's 260 mil tall. They're basically how tall they are. You buy a set of towers from Select and using the set of towers, the set of beams, the jig bed, and then individual parts that fit into those towers, you can fit any car to the same jig. That's the principle of operation. And so these, these, this data is provided by Select for known cars. Now, obviously, if you're working on a car where they've never provided that data, you'd be on your own slightly. But you're still a lot closer, even if you haven't got that information, to being able to mount a body shell or a car or a chassis to the jig than you would be if you didn't have the jig at all and you're having to work from the ground up. So it's a very good system, quite time consuming to attach the car to, which is why the crash repair world has gone away from that a little bit. Um, because it, it, it is, it's quite expensive to do. So you tend to find that select jig benches and perhaps some of the car aligner type jig benches are generally aimed more at the high end, more expensive vehicles where the crash repair, more expensive repair times could be more justified uh, because it is more time consuming to fix the car to them. But arguably once it's fixed to them, they're extremely accurate. It's possible to make sure that every single part is exactly in alignment because these, these, these parts, the, 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 um, the, the jig attachments, the jig fixtures, that's the word, the fixtures, basically won't align. They won't connect to the suspension parts. If something's out of line, they just won't fit. So that's the first indicator. And then obviously you can use a measuring system then to find out how far out of alignment they are. But physically, the, the fixtures just won't fit if the car's out of alignment. So I think that's a, the, a bit of a background on why we use jigs, chiefly for chassis design and build and for checking alignment. And then we'll use this particular example here as to exactly the process we'd go through and why, we, why we're doing it in this particular instance, as this is quite a good little case study as to why we're doing what we're doing. So select bench is parked here with a basic set of beams on it, which will, they're not currently positioned, but they will be positioned as per the drawing in my little book, which is a drawing for BMW E30. We will then position the towers Pardon me. We will then position the towers onto the beams as per the drawing, and the fixture set, which I haven't got to hand, but you'll see shortly. The fixture set will, the fixtures will all be with those towers. In the background, we've removed the suspension assemblies from the body shell. There are two ways of fitting the body shell to the uh, jig. You can, it can be done with or without the suspension assemblies in. For this particular instance, we want it without the suspension assemblies in. So we're then going to, we've lifted, we've dropped the suspension assemblies off. We've lifted the car up on the select jig lift, which is, it doesn't need to be a select jig lift. You can use a forklift, you can use a number of things to lift the car. Basically, you just need a way of lifting the car and then moving it sideways to, so it's above the jig bench. We use a select jig lift. It's quite a good way of doing it, works quite well. So we've lifted the car up, dropped the suspension assemblies off. We'll then bring that over. We'll put four of our fixtures in place, four of these towers onto the beams. Once the beams are all in the correct positions, we'll put four towers on. We'll then bring the car over and we'll lower it onto those four towers and fix it to those using the bolts and the pins that allow that body shell to be fixed onto those towers. At that point, it's then attached to the jig. We can then add all of the other fixtures as we see fit. We won't actually need all of them in this particular case, but we could add all of the fixtures on that, on that diagram and more if we wanted to add any ourselves. But we would add the other fixtures to then fixture all the uh, position critical points on the car. And the exam this example here, this will be done because a number of the panels on the car will be replaced with carbon fiber panels. And that isn't a job you want to do with any of the body shell out of position. So that's one stage of it. The other stage of it is also just checking that the car hasn't got any pre-existing accident damage that's put a suspension um, pickup point out of position. So we'll locate the car on the jig, put, our, put all our um, uh, uh, fixture pieces in place and have the car bolted down to the jig. And at that point, we can then remove the steel panels that are going to be replaced with carbon fiber panels without any fear at all of the body shell moving out of position. So on this particular example, the roof skin will be removed, the quarter panels will be removed, and some other, some other, uh, some other panel work at the rear of the car will be removed, which could cause things to go out of alignment. 
if, if the car wasn't adequately supported. Supplementary to this, we actually have another fixture set that we've made, which actually bolts internally inside the body shell. That's additional to the jig. We actually have another fixture set that bolts internally to a number of structural points inside the body shell, mainly seatbelt anchorage points and the rear suspension pickups that actually then locates the internal structure of the car as well as being bolted to the jig. So that's an additional point on that one. But that basically makes the car completely structurally solid and all fitted to the jig solidly, bolted on. And at that point, we know that all of the suspension pickups are to the correct alignment as set by Select, which was all based on data provided by BMW originally when the car was designed. So at that point, we know everything's correct. As an offshoot to that, as an example of where the other main use that we put these jig benches to is that they are a flat level surface with, an e with a number of relatively easy ways of fixing cars to them. The, so when we're, when we're doing some bespoke chassis work, we can use one of these as a really good datum, a basis datum. Uh, to do all of our measurements for all of our key points on a chassis build for a car. So, as an example, the Morris Minor that was built for the uh, locating all of the key suspension pickup points on that, which were, as you may, as any uh, watchers of our sort of uh, uh, weekly uncut series will have seen, uses Mazda MX-5 suspension um, pickups well, Mazda MX-5 suspension assemblies, we made uh, the jig fixtures to carry the MX-5 suspension assemblies on the select jig, and we then located the Morris Minor body shell over those and then built the structure between the two, knowing that the suspension assemblies were aligned correctly and then that the body shell could then be aligned relative to those and then the gaps in between filled in, basically. Um, so that's the other way of doing it, is we can build a chassis to suit suspension assemblies using this as a solid base to work from. And further to that, some components that aren't shown here, but Jamie will uh, put some in the video, the, uh, the sill clamps. There are a set of sill clamps that also go on these jigs. These, these side mounting points carry a large pin that locates on those and carries a set of uh, adjustable clamps that come off that clamp to the sill flange on a body shell that's fitted to this. Not all cars have sill flanges. Notably, we're doing some, we're starting a Mark 1 Escort project and Mark Escorts don't have sill flanges. So, so not all that useful on cars like that. But a lot of cars do have a sill flange. It's a generally sort of fairly universal part. Um, and on that basis, you can attach the body shell initially to the sill clamps, the four clamps, they just pinch the sill flange um, on this BMW. It does have one. We're not going to use them, but it does have them. Basically, here, you would pinch this point in the sill clamps. It would clamp it near the jacking points, front and rear. And that enables you to centre the car up and level it on those sill clamps. And you can actually just, you, if you were doing crash repair work, you could actually just clamp it in the sill clamps and then do pulling operations and alignment operations just with it held in those. We're not going to use them on this because we don't need them on this. But interesting, when I was working on the Morris Minor, again, the body, I, clamped, I held the body on the sill clamps so I could move it and align it using the adjustments on the sill clamps and then held the suspension assemblies on the tower fixtures on the actual jig bed and it enabled me to align the body to the suspension assemblies until I was happy that the, arc, the, the wheel centre lines were all correct for the wheel centres on the body, as correct as they could be. You know, there's a bit of miss... <laughs> the bodies aren't that accurate, but as accurate as you can be to get the, uh, the wheel centre lines correct. So it does enable you then to use to clamp a, a body on the sill clamps and build your chassis on the jig bed and align the two separately, which is quite a, quite a nice way of working. So they're a very, very useful bit of equipment. And then I'm going to cover some questions. I've not got all of the questions. Um, not, I've not got everybody's questions here. There's a bit of a selection. Each uh, time we do one of the autofocus auto videos, I'm going to try and go through a few more questions each time. So just feel free to keep sticking them on the comments on YouTube, and I'll, uh, I'll pick a selection to go through. There's not really any, uh, any method to my picking. It's just uh, it's, it's fairly willy-nilly. Um, I think I've got the usernames on a few of these. First one was uh, a user called Farmer John uh, saying, uh, talking about zinc spraying his farm machinery and wanting a bit more information on that. We're going to do a video a bit further down the line when it sort of in, incorporates into the process a bit better. It, when we, as we're going through the restoration process, we'll try and incorporate that a bit further down the line. Uh, going a bit more in depth on the zinc spraying process. But it, briefly, in answer to your question, yes, you kind of do need the flow meters. 
the flows are quite critical for that particular for the torch that's used the metco torch the flows are quite crucial so you do need the flow meters really i don't think it was quite difficult to get the, the get the torch set up correctly with the flow meters i imagine trying to do it without them wouldn't work at all really um and remember you do need to do the blasting immediately before the zinc spraying there can't really be any there can't be more than a you know not too many minutes really time delay between doing the uh, blasting and the zinc spraying so but yeah it, it's ideal for farm machinery and it's pretty much going to last pretty much indefinitely maybe a muck spreader wouldn't but but a lot of machinery would last fairly indefinitely if it was zinc sprayed so that's that uh, Southney had asked um, about uh, welding rod diameter on the little um, welding demonstration I did on the welding table he'd asked about what diameter of welding rod I use generally try ish within the realms of possibility to use a similar thickness of welding rod to the thickness of steel you're using. I was using a 1.2 millimeter thick welding rod for welding 1.2 millimeter thick 18 gauge steel. One millimeter welding rod would be fine. 0.8 millimeter welding rod would be okay to push. And 1.6 millimeter welding rod would be okay to push. I probably wouldn't go outside of those, but I was using 1.2, same, same as the material thickness, which is generally what you'd aim for. Uh, Miles Fowler had asked a question about um, the, the limit on the length of the uh, continuous TIG weld uh, when we were doing the butt weld on a long panel and, uh, and whether we would use pulse. Uh, yes, you can use two, two, two questions there really. Yes, feel free to use pulse. It has advantages, it has no disadvantages, it has some advantages. It's not a necessity, but it does make the heat control a little bit easier when you're doing the weld. You can generally get a smaller heat affected zone using pulse than you can not using pulse. That would be the only thing I'd say there really. It ha has some advantages, but they're not, they're not huge. Um, and the, uh, yeah, the other part was the weld length limit. No, there's not really a length limit. The key is not letting the weld cool off uh, rod changes you can stop for a very very brief second to change uh, welding rods or to reposition yourself but the more cooling happens while you do that change the more you'll get a radial shrink on the end of that weld so where you're getting the, the shrink the inward side to side shrink as you go along the weld when you get to the end of the weld you'll get a radial shrink all the way around it and the more cooling you let happen while you're changing rod or moving, the more you'll get an end shrink or radial shrink on that stop point, and the more, and then that will cause a dip in your final weld, which will be make panel beating it harder, make it much more difficult to panel beat. So the less you can, the more continuous you can keep the heat, keep the heat input and the material input all the way along the weld, the easier it will be to panel beat and get all straight afterwards. So it's just that's that's the uh, that's what you need to sort of think about really. Is yes, you can do it. There's not uh, there's no limit on the length other than the stoppages that you're inevitably going to have as you go along that weld and trying to minimise them. So that's that. Uh, next question was, Steve Pierce in Australia. I can't remember what his comment was. Something to do with training of people or thing, some, something to do with training of people or um, younger people uh, getting into the trade in Australia. What I would say, uh, very much, very, very linked to Australia, is actually the most informative person I've watched in the metal shaping and general metal uh, restoration world uh, is in Australia, is Pete Tomasini. Uh, I strongly advise if you want to learn about metal shaping, get his DVDs and watch his stuff on YouTube. He's a very, very, very talented metal shaper. Um, we've, I've got his DVDs. He's an extremely, very, very, very clever chap when it comes to metal shaping. Making panels that we would divide up into several pieces in one piece. He really is the man, and his hammer skills are on another level. His hammer skills are incredible. So I strongly recommend having a look at Pete Tomasini's videos. And yeah, he's, a, he's a, an Italian-Australian. Uh, very, very much worth watching. Uh, and then moving on, hang on, I've got my phone up here, let me carry on, uh, yes, we've got uh, Charles CP uh, had asked about the air mains that we have around, the, what the blue airlines are around the workshop, random question, uh, very easy to answer, they are John Guest air main fittings, you buy them, John Guest make them, they're pretty reasonably priced, you can buy them in all sorts of sizes and they do exactly what they say on the tin, we've never had a problem with one of them, they're all brilliant. Um, 
Malcolm the Wasp had asked about the videos and uh, the sort of the, the I, I, my, my answer was simply we I can't remember what the exact question was now but basically it was to do with um, whether we make money from these videos and you know that we that, that we're unlikely to have a very big audience sort of interested in this level of detail and we, we, could, we couldn't be making much money from it well no we're not <laughs> we're not making much we make I think we'll be making a very small amount but I doubt it will pay mine and Jamie behind the cameras uh, time for doing them but it's one of those things that we thought actually it brings a bit of breadth to the business it's quite interesting to share the knowledge it just increases the interest around our business so that's why we do it but certainly it isn't making a great deal of money no um, Trifonius Zonobloom had asked about vapor blasting and a description of the process is what I was uh, going to do for that which is very very briefly uh, a lot of people talk about vapor blasting a lot of people get it in their head that it is literally blasting with a vapor which is what you would think it is given the given that title it isn't it is blasting with a mixture of a liquid and a solid um, and it is very good for certain things. Uh, it's not, but, but the, the most common form of vapor blasting is using water with some chemical additives and glass bead, which is what you, it's commonly used for cleaning up aluminium castings. That's great, but it's not night and day better than dry glass bead blasting. The water does bring a bit of benefit to the process, but it's not night and day different. Um, it's very good for cleaning up aluminium castings, but yeah, vapor blasting is generally glass bead mixed with water, blasted with compressed air. Uh, that, that's, that, that's that process. Uh, who else have we got? Uh, Parrot Razor had asked questions about uh, what had we thought about auto helmets. I probably didn't really go into enough detail on that when I was doing the well thing. Yes, I was using an automatic helmet on that, and yes, we all use auto helmets. Generally, we've got speed glass helmets. Um, I think mine's a 9100XX, I think. Uh, they're quite expensive. I think they're just shy of 400 quid. But what price is your eyesight? And more to the point, what, 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 how much pride do you take in the welds? Basically, the better the hat, the better you can see, the better weld you can do. It's fairly sort of straight line <laughs> um, link there. Really, you need to be able to see to be able to do the weld. Um, so yeah, we, yes, we all use automatic helmets on that. And then I think uh, Ivan Tenhave uh, had asked about um, close-ups on the welds and maybe using a, sh uh, a filter on the camera so we could see close-ups on the welds. We're not really going to get into that. We're not. Really really the channel for doing that we're going to give a bit of a flavor because there's a, such a big process to cover that w much as I'd love to do a load of things about welding we're not we have we can't really go into that great that depth on every single process that we do so I would say go and have a look at the welding tips and tricks channel with Jody he does brilliant zoom ins brilliant macro shots brilliant filter shots of welds and it's some there's some really good short little videos on he, he's done a, I can't remember the title of the video but he's done a really good video on the, I think it's the, the top three things you'll do wrong when you're TIG welding that's probably the most beneficial video you'll watch if you're learning to TIG weld is his top three things you'll do wrong uh, about torch angle and various other things um, watch that pretty much that will, if you've got your hand in reasonably to start with on TIG welding then watch that video and you'll be 10 times better <laughs> so but yeah all, Jody stuff on welding tips and tricks just watch that we're not going to go into the tiny detail about exactly how we do you know all the details of welding we, we can't really fit that in and do the rest of the series we want to do because if we went into that detail on every process we'll be still here in four years doing this series so so go, go to Welding Tips and Tricks and Jody will show you all you need to know. And I think that wraps it all up for this week. I think I've covered enough uh, questions there. So keep sending the questions in. Send loads of questions in about this. So, uh, ask me lots about jigs and we'll find out what I don't know because it'll be quite a lot. I probably There's more I don't know than I do know, that's for sure. So send us loads of questions in and I'll do my best to answer them. So see you again soon.